Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thank you for tuning in. I want to say a quick thanks to my guest on last week's episode, singer-songwriter from the Joni Mitchell Project, Kiki Epson. If you didn't get to hear it, you can listen to all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. Also, be sure to tune in for my upcoming conversations with guests, including jazz violinist Jean-Luc Ponte, singer-actress Frenchie Davis, percussionist Lenny Castro, composer, arranger, Artie Butler, and bassist artist, Nathan East. Those are just a few of the people on our upcoming shows, so keep listening. And uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the companies that help me sound my best, whether I'm performing live or in the studio recording and producing music. Blue Microphones, Taylor Guitars, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Mesa Boogie Amps, Diderio Strings and Planet Waves, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, and exotic effects. So often I get asked questions about the creative process. So I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in business to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is entertainment attorney Michael Morris. Michael Morris has blended his tax law expertise with his passion for music and entertainment, resulting in a practice that is unique. As a former trial lawyer for the IRS and a certified specialist in taxation law, Michael provides insightful resolutions to his clients' complicated tax, estate, and business transaction issues. In the entertainment industry, Michael has developed a strong reputation of providing valuable and effective business solutions in areas such as copyright and contractual matters. Although Michael's core competency is within the tax arena in entertainment, he has developed significant expertise covering a wide range of businesses. His diverse client base includes major studio executives, recording artists, including Grammy winners, production companies, film and TV composers, talent agencies, payroll companies, skin healthcare companies, post-production houses, software companies, and an award-winning winery. Please welcome my guest today, Michael Morris. Hi, Michael. Thanks for uh, joining us on the show today. Hey, Terry. It's my pleasure. So nice to be here. I want to begin our conversation by saying that you've been my lawyer and friend for over 30 years, and I appreciate you so much and everything that you bring to my life as a friend and also in guiding me in my career as the music business continues to change. So thank you. And and also this is, it's not really a disclaimer. It's actually an endorsement. I want to say that if anybody is looking for a good entertainment attorney, you might want to consider using the guy that I've been with for all these years and stick around for this hour and you'll get an idea of why. Which credit card do you want, Terry? Yeah, (laughs) it's the usual. (laughs) Let me ask you something before we get into personal history. At at what point of an artist's career do you think they should start thinking about choosing a lawyer? That's always a case-by-case situation, Terry. Because if an artist is just getting started and they are working on their craft, they are just starting to perform, there's no crying need for an attorney. But but certainly at the point when there is sufficient interest for somebody to want the artist to sign on the dotted line, the strongest advice I can give is don't sign anything without consulting a good, competent lawyer. That sounds like great advice. So let's talk about your life. Before we delve into your career, what was your childhood like, and where did you grow up? I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, now known for being the place where Chris Christie (laughs) went to high school, but I went to high school there first, Mm -hmm. and Livingston was outside of New York City, 
which was great because beginning at the age 13, 14, I would hop on a bus with friends or my sister, and we would go into New York City, which was only a half-hour bus ride away, but now you were going to the world's biggest playground, and quite frankly, back in those days, you didn't quite have the concerns you did today in terms of a 13 or a 14 or 15-year-old getting on a bus traveling with one or two other people. So it was right. a different time, but certainly it was a wonderful time uh, to be growing up. And, you know, living so close to the city that I would imagine it exposed you to um, a lot of culture and art. You were s- certainly exposed to people from all around the world, which I'm guessing also led you to your your love of traveling and, and art. But I know that you've got some pretty creative people in your family as well. Can you talk about them? Sure, I'd love to. Let's start with my mother. My mother was a piano teacher, as was my grandmother, but my mother also was a member of the Masterwork Chorus, and they would perform at Carnegie Hall and Town Hall, so we would be going into New York during Christmas time to see the Masterwork Chorus perform. They would do Handel's Messiah, and of course, Carnegie Hall at that time was the mecca for classical music in the United States, and my mother also had a classical radio program, speaking of radio. So I grew up between the piano lessons and sometimes being dragged, but sometimes going willingly to classical concerts. That was my initial introduction to music. We would go up to, say, Tanglewood, and I'd be six years old meeting uh, the great cellist, Pablo Casals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I never got good at any instrument, by the way. Uh, My mother tried very (laughs) hard to teach me piano, Uh, Then in college, out of frustration, I picked up and got, okay, but that was it with guitar. However, my sister was another story, because my sister not only took to piano, but she took to guitar, and she ended up living in New York City in the early 80s, and she lived in Little Italy, and she became a, a member of the Manhattan Light Opera Company, her major in college was voice, so she actually became pretty damn good at it uh, to the point that she was performing in the Manhattan Light Opera Company. It was pretty funny because I would go to visit her, and originally she had an apartment in Little Italy, and it was four flights up, and she would practice her opera with the windows open, and of course, (laughs) as you know, a lot of the opera was Italian, which endeared her to the neighborhood, particularly those in control of the neighborhood. Putting it another way, nobody messed with my sister. They loved the Jewish kids singing Italian opera. Love that. (laughs) Did you ever um, pursue singing as well, or that was just not your, one of your gifts? I I never thought about doing it seriously. Uh, In in law school, I I would jam with friends, and even Mm -hmm. to this day, I have uh, other friends who have these jam parties. Uh, My friend Ron Moss, who was the star of The Bold and Beautiful, and he he and his wife, Devin DeVosquez, are dear friends and clients. But Ron, back in the day, before he became a huge soap opera star, actually had a band that had a number one hit. He was one of the founding Mm -hmm. members of Player. And what Ron likes right. to do is he'll have these great, great jam parties. And of course, I always invite my musician friends. But if I have a few drinks in me, I'll, I'll get up there and give it my best Willie Dixon or Robert Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> you also had a great uncle who is a well-known Broadway producer. Could you talk about him? Uh, that That's true. That's very true. My great uncle was Walter Freed. And He and his wife lived in New York City. They had a beautiful, beautiful co-op literally across the street from the Museum of Natural History. And he and his partner, Kermit Bloomgarden, were the original producers of plays like Death of a Salesman and All My Sons. They were actually good friends with Arthur Miller. And I'll tell you a funny story because in junior high school, we were reading in one of the humanities classes, Death of a Salesman, and I happened to flip through the pages, and I saw 
originally presented on Broadway, I forget the year, but it was a long time ago, by Walter Freed and Kermit Bloomgarden. Without even thinking, I sort of shouted out in front of the whole class, that's my uncle! Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yes, we, we had a lot of uh, very creative people in the family, uh, and that, of course, included my great uncle. So how, how old were you when you knew that you wanted to become an attorney? Because so far, everything we've been talking about is art. I was a weird one when it came to that. (laughs) I'll tell you why. Because I used to mow the lawn. Well, I would mow lawns to make some extra dollars. Me too. That was something which people would do in New Jersey during the Mm -hmm. summer and spring. You would mow lawns, and during the winter, you would shovel snow. Mm -hmm. Something much unheard about here in beautiful Southern California. But my parents' friends were Leonard and Mary Rosenstein, and I was mowing their lawn. And Leonard Rosenstein was an attorney, and I thought that was the coolest thing. Wow, he was an attorney. He dealt with people. He would share stories with me from time to time. So in junior high school, to show you what a nerd I was, I joined a future lawyers club in junior high school. Wow. Yeah, that's nerdy. <laughs> Most people wait till they're in high school to do that. <laughs> so. Not even in high school yet. Right. <laughs> so it just, you, you, it's, it's just something. Tough. And What was it about law that made you want to practice? I mean, what were you just intrigued by the whole legal system or helping people or what, what really what what was the fire in it for you? It was kind of a combination because I always was very politically active. And when I say politically active, I mean going to protest the Vietnam War in 1969, I believe, 69 or 70, going down to Washington, D.C. My best friend's father was very politically active, as were a, a lot of people. It was a different time, but, of course, the country was extremely divided. I remember going to uh, political rallies to protest. And so I had that in me. And, you know, as a consequence, when I started college, and remember the Vietnam War was not even over yet. Uh, I was Did you serve? All- were you, were you no, no, drafted? No, I, I, okay. no, no I, was, I was lucky. When the draft came along, I actually had very high draft numbers. So we all had to enlist. But that was as far as it went. The military service in my family is my father served in World War II in Korea, and uh, mm-hmm. I actually had an uncle who sadly died in World War II uh, at mm-hmm. the Battle of the Bulge. But you know, when it came to my generation, we all had to sign up for the draft, which we did. But I, I right. remember my numbers were in the three hundreds, so literally right, we would I have had as well. like a, a yeah. world war before they would have gotten up to my number. But mm-hmm. started college. And I was taking everything under the sun, political science. I was taking constitutional law classes. So it just was something that started to become part of my DNA, that I would like to get involved in the legal process. I would like to get involved. I've always been a people person. You you know that. You know me 30 years. So it just seemed a great synthesize my interest in politics, the fact that I had done well uh, in uh, all the political science classes I took, the a constitutional law class I took at University of Pennsylvania. So, you know, one thing led to another, and I pretty much knew that I was going to go to law school. And you ended up in law school in Arizona, is that correct? That's correct. And that's sort of an interesting story also, because my parents, of course, lived in New Jersey for much of their life. And I was in my first year of college in Philadelphia. I'll never forget. It was snowing out Philadelphia. I get a phone call. My parents say, we've just bought a house in Tucson. (laughs) Now, nobody consulted me, but they were, (laughs) exactly. Uh, They had bought their house in Arizona before even selling a house in New Jersey, and they moved out to Tucson uh, in 1972. And, you know, here I was. I had a girlfriend in New Jersey. I had all my friends in Philadelphia, New Jersey, but I would start spending summers in Tucson and winters, and during the winter breaks, I would say to my friends in Philadelphia, because I had a van 
and uh, you know, hair below my shoulders, and I would say, mm -hmm. who wants to drive to Tucson and we'll get away from the Philadelphia winter for a few weeks? So on several mm -hmm. occasions, I'd have four or five friends. We would drive literally nonstop from Philadelphia to Tucson, and we'd spend the winter breaks there, and we'd have a good old time. And uh -huh. then what happened is, while well, I enjoyed going to the University of Pennsylvania, where I got my BA and master's degrees, I was getting pretty tired of Philadelphia, and I also had student loans. University of Arizona offered me residency rates to go to law school. That was 10% of what University of Pennsylvania wanted. So you added it up, and here I am, westward bound. So that's where I ended right. up going to law school in Tucson, Arizona, University of Arizona. And once you uh, had a few years of thawing out, uh, in addition to getting a, a great education, you really didn't want to move back east at that point, right? You want, Had you considered moving to New York or back to New Jersey? Or did you want no, to keep no, stay warm? I was, and, I, I was pointing the other way toward Los Angeles. And, and one reason was in uh, 1971, while I was still in high school, uh, I graduated and I drove across country with my best friend from high school. We drove all over Canada. We camped at Yellowstone, Yosemite. We camped at Glacier National Park. But my father had a first cousin. Sadly, he's no longer with us. He was an attorney practicing in Los Angeles. And of course, wherever we would have family friends rather than camp, we would stay with family friends. So my father, Martin Morris's first cousin was Marty Ostrow. And he was an interesting, great man. He had been a general in the Air Force in World War II, and you could count the number of Jewish generals on one hand, and you didn't need all five fingers. <laughs> I, need, <laughs> and, I need to right. hold, have you hold your thought. We're moving into our first commercial break, and yeah. we'll finish the story of how you ended up in Los Angeles and uh, more stories of your career in your life. I'm here with Michael Morris. We'll be right back. serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? This is filmmaker Danny Gold of If You're Not in the Obit, Eat Breakfast, and you're listening to Making It with Terry Walton. Welcome. 
Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. I'm here with entertainment attorney Michael Morris. And Michael, you were just telling the story of moving out here to Los Angeles in 1971 from New Jersey to Pennsylvania to Tucson and then Los Angeles. So what was the rest of that story? Right. So I'll pick up. So here it is. It's 1971. Hadn't even started college yet. I was about to start at University of Pennsylvania, but spent that summer driving all over America, part of Canada, and came down to Los Angeles, and we were staying, as I said, with my father's first cousin, Martin Ostrow. And his niece was a cousin I had never met before. Her name was Doreen Ringer Ross. And I'll never forget, we pulled up to Marty's house, and I met Doreen, and my first thought was, we don't have any blondes in our family. Well, we didn't, not then, <laughs> now. <laughs> but that was Doreen's look, and she was cool then, and she's cool now, because she took us to parties. She was incredibly well-connected. I remember she told us where to go, and I think we went up to the Whiskey A Go-Go. So my first real introduction to L.A. was hanging out with my cousin Doreen, And if you fast forward more years than I care to count, Doreen is extremely prominent uh, in the music industry because she is the vice president of film TV at BMI, and she is a much beloved person in the music industry, which I always thought was pretty funny that we both sort of ended up in related (laughs) fields. And that, that was 1971. So that gave me my first real taste of Los Angeles. Got it. So, so let's, let's also talk about when you were growing up in New York, I know you went to a lot of concerts at the Fillmore and other venues. You, you saw amazing bands at Jefferson Airplane, Buddy Guy, Birds, Eric Clapton, Joe Cocker, The Who. You saw Tommy at Lincoln yeah. Center well, and yeah, Leonard yeah, Skinner at opening for the, I mean, these are amazing uh, music history that you uh, were there. You were there. You were exposed to this and influenced by this. It certainly was a real case of being at the right place at the right time because, Mm -hmm. yes, we would go into New York and you could go to a show where we would see Eric Clapton with Delaney and Bonnie and the ticket was $5 and he'd be in the third Mm -hmm. or fourth row. I remember seeing Buddy Guy uh, open for the Jefferson Airplane at the Fillmore. And it's true, we went to see The Who. Tommy was all over the place, my God, the rock opera. And we were at Lincoln Center, and again, you didn't have to go through a 1,000 ticket brokers. It was a different time back then. You could pretty much get tickets to just about anything, and that included seeing The Who at Lincoln Center. I'll never forget, in the lobby, Bill Graham was standing next to me, and I had to have been all of 17 years old when that happened. So... Mm -hmm. And in addition to the rock side, where they would have these phenomenal great concerts in Central Park, so we saw a lot of good shows there. I remember seeing Carly Simon, among other people. I don't remember everybody. Shout out, nah, how's that for dating me? But you had these <laughs> beautiful series of outdoor concerts. You had the Fillmore. And also, you had wonderful, wonderful jazz in uh, primarily in uh, the village in New York City. So... You know, as a kid, literally as a 17-year-old, I was going to the top of the gate to see people like Bill Evans, uh, going to the Village Vanguard to see Ross and Roland Kirk. And, mm. you know, you would just go because you'd read about it, or sometimes you'd just stumble into it. I'll tell you one other funny story. There was a play that was at the bottom of the gate, the legendary club in New York City, and the play was called Lemmings. And I'd read a little review about it. I think I was maybe 18 years old. And we went to see the play. Well, this is the play that was from the Not Ready for Primetime Players from Chicago. And it included people like Joe Cocker. It included Dan Aykroyd. It included many of the original members of Saturday Night Live, none of whom we had ever heard of. But I'll never forget sitting five feet from John Belushi, 
when he did his Joe Cocker imitation and he was doing a commercial for muscular dystrophy. <laughs> Boy, those that, those were some really wonderful times <laughs> with a, a lot of a, uh, a lot of freedom, a, a very creative time in in um, in theater and in in music and in comedy. Absolutely. Right. So, yeah. So, so when I started college, I already had a pretty well developed love of music and the arts. Uh, and then, of course, I started at University of Pennsylvania. But your love of music was actually quite eclectic because I don't know a lot of people who were listening to Buddy Guy and knew who Roland Kirk was or Bill Evans, you know, or, you know, although it was a different time because radio played everything. You know, on one station, you would actually hear jazz and blues and rock and R&B and, and even – Gil Scott Heron doing the revolution will not be televised, you know, like all on the same station. So I guess it, it was probably easier to be open-minded about music. Actually, it wasn't even a question of being open-minded. You were exposed to it. So you sort of took it as a natural segue. For example, you would see Miles Davis. I did not go to the show, but I remember Miles Davis opening for Santana at the Fillmore. Right. Great that example. was because Bill right. Graham was so creative. Or you know, I'll share one funny story with you, uh, because I was very fortunate to have represented the late great uh, blues guitarist Albert Collins, mm -hmm. and I have an original poster. Yes, Albert. He was called the Master of the Telecaster, and I've got mm -hmm. some original posters from the Fillmore. And one of the bills was Albert Collins with Creedence Clearwater and Fleetwood Mac, and this was the Fillmore West, but I was able to get the poster because we had done a deal years later with the Winterland folk, and I was fortunate enough to meet Mick Fleetwood, who was a big fan of uh, Albert Collins, and I said to Mick, you know, I've got a poster, and it's Fleetwood Mac, Creedence Clearwater, and Albert Collins on the same bill at the Fillmore. And Mick Fleetwood put his hand on his heart, and he said, now that tells a story, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, so, it certainly does. Right. So, so I, want, want, I, want you to, I want to delve into when you were at the University of Pennsylvania, which was 1971 to 75, and you were working in a jazz club and, and doing a lot of other really interesting things. Could you talk about that? So here I am, my first year at University of Pennsylvania, which, by the way, was founded literally by Benjamin Franklin. And I was living in the oldest section of the university housing. It's called the Quad. And I was living in Rodney Hall, I believe, was where my room was. And these were old, Terry, I and mean, this stuff was built in the 1800s. The yeah. guy across the hall from me was Jules. I forget his last name, but Jules was a character. He was a total stoner. He was <laughs> always playing jazz. And I found out he was also a jazz DJ at WXPN. And WXPN then and now was a very influential college station. Mm -hmm. uh, like Allison Steele came out of WXPN, the World Cafe, which a lot of people listen to, to this day, uh, comes out of WXPN. So here Jules is. He's a DJ for WXPN. He's a jazzer. He takes me to the radio station. I'd never been inside a radio station like that in my life. And I thought, how cool is this? He's doing his own thing. And then he said, by the way, there's a nonprofit jazz club in the basement of a church on campus. And it was called the Foxhole. And that was pretty legendary also because you had quite a few wonderful jazz musicians play there, and they liked coming there because it was a very friendly environment. It was large enough you could get maybe 200, 250 people in there, but it was in the basement of a church on campus, and Jules said, man, you ought to work here. You ought to hang with us. And it didn't take much arm twisting, and next thing I know, I'm spending a lot of serious time working in a jazz club on campus at University of Pennsylvania. So that was my first real intro to jazz. I'd, I appreciated it before, but Jules sort of got me immersed in it. It was like my baptism into jazz because of Jules. 
And you were also a music critic for uh, one of the, the local papers, correct? Actually, for both of them. I was a writer for both the Daily Pennsylvanian and the Pennsylvania Voice. And, of course, Terry, that was, for an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid, the best way to get all your records. <laughs> yes, they were vinyl for free. All your backstage passes, all your tickets for free because – the college scene it was very important to launching people's careers. So the record labels and the promoters were very anxious to get the reviews, particularly the record labels. So at that time, I could contact just about any label as a writer for the Daily Pennsylvania and pretty much give them a laundry list of what I wanted. And they would send me a lot of records that I didn't want. So, <laughs> <laughs> right? so, so as a consequence, again, it was really a case of being at the right place at the right time because during that time period, it was sort of amazing when I look back on it. Uh, you know, I would attend shows where I'd be backstage with Linda Ronstadt opening for Jackson Brown. One of my first interviews was with a British rock band that at the time was pretty influential because David Bowie had produced their hit, All the Young Dudes. So I interviewed one of the musicians, the bass player from Monta Hoople, and it was a very unknown band who opened for Mata Hoople, and that was Aerosmith. Are you kidding? <laughs> That's great. Uh, I, I am not kidding. So Aerosmith <laughs> opened for Mata Hoople. Now, I'll never forget seeing them because I had no idea who they were because I was there because Mata Hoople was pretty influential at the time. And I remember sure. I looked at the band and I thought the lead singer is trying really hard to be Mick Jagger and the lead guitarist is trying very hard to be Jeff Beck. And of course, one of the songs they did was the Yardbird song, which was The Train Kept a Rolling, which wasn't even an original Yardbird song. It was, I think, a Johnny Burnett song from the 1950s that Jeff Beck had taken when he was in the Yardbirds and they made it their own. And then, of course, Aerosmith mm -hmm. made it their own. If you don't mind me jumping forward about uh, 50 years, I went to Not see. Enough. Okay, so, and by the way, I'm a music player who loves going to music shows. And speaking yes. of Buddy Guy, last year I went to see 50 Years of Jeff Beck with Buddy Guy opening. But one of mm -hmm. Jeff's vocalists was Steve Tyler. And what do you think they mm -hmm. did? The train kept a rolling. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> right? And I thought, well, boy, if that doesn't go around and come around, what does? Because I saw Steve mm -hmm. Tyler do that. Literally, and it had to have been 1972, opening for Mata Hoople, and it was a Yardbirds cut. A great memories. So, but that also shows you what's so great about music, that somebody can take something that's been done before, they can make it their own, they can continue a tradition, they can uh, pass it on, they can move it forward. And of course, as a musician, you know a lot about that. So mm -hmm. here I am at University of Pennsylvania, I'm going to shows like that, and I am interviewing a lot of really cool people. So I got to interview Ravi Shankar, uh, Dan Fogelberg, Roger McGlynn from The Birds. I remember seeing Patti Smith opening for Eric Burden. So a lot of people who nobody had ever heard of. And I, I remember this funny story about Patti Smith because I'm sitting about five feet from her. I did not know who she was. She had a ripped T-shirt with a picture of Keith Richard on it. And she did mm -hmm. about a 15-minute version of Gloria, the Van Morrison then song. And I thought, well, any rocker who wants to do that with a Keith Richard t-shirt on is all right by me. That's right. Hey, how did you meet your first music client? So here I am living in Los Angeles. And by the way, I was, in addition to being a, a huge music fan, I did, I did well in law school, but I also had a natural uh, affinity for numbers, and I did extremely well in the tax classes. I did well in law school, period. I might sound like I'm bragging, but that is a fact. I did very well in law school. But I thought, you know, I think I want well, to get my speak, You know back. something? Speaking of bragging, let me interject because I can brag on your behalf. You were named – as one of L.A.'s top 100 lawyers in 2009 by the L.A. Business Journal and as a super lawyer among Southern California lawyers for seven consecutive years. So um, I'll just get that bragging out of the way, and you can go back to your story. Hmm, okay, well, your listeners can't see it, but I'm blushing a bit. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, You're welcome. So I applied for a job with the IRS, the Treasury Department, to be uh, an attorney with them because I thought, you know, if I get a background in tax, that will always stand me in good stead because it's applicable to so many different areas. And uh, I, that proved to be uh, pretty uh, pretty accurate uh, in terms of go fast forward with my legal career. So I had put in my time with the IRS, and my first first boss, then partner, Paul Husband, hired me out of the IRS, and he wanted a tax lawyer. And what I said to him was, because I'm living in L.A., I'm going to all these rock shows, jazz clubs like the Comeback Inn down in Venice. All back right. in the, And I said to Paul, well, okay, I don't mind doing the tax side of law, and I, I certainly will do that as part of your law firm's needs, but I also want to branch out into music law, and I started taking classes at UCLA in recording agreements, music publishing, and Paul said, I have no problem with that. He encouraged me because he had worked for Jay Cooper. At the time, the firm was Cooper, Epstein, and Hurwitz, and mm -hmm. Jay is a legendary, legendary, did I say legendary? Yeah, Attorney, he certainly uh, one, has. One of the yeah. finest music lawyers, and I, I've had the privilege over low these many years to have done panels with Jay to become good friends with him. But at the time, Paul had left Jay's firm and he said, I have no problem you doing that because when I was at Cooper Epstein, I used to do litigation and some of it was entertainment litigation. So mm -hmm. I'm at a New Year's Eve party. I had just left the Hey, Michael, IRS. I'm going to make this one a, I'm going to interrupt and make this one a cliffhanger because we're heading into our next break. Uh, okay. So I want every everybody to stick around to hear the story of uh, meeting your first client. And it's such an interesting story because you, again, you work for the IRS as a tax uh, attorney and then moved into entertainment and made it all work together. So everybody stick around. We're going to just take a short break and we will be right back with my guest, Michael Morris. Adam Berry, and you're listening to Making It with Terry Wood. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on InterTalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs you know what's all around you every waking moment of your life marketing you're choking on it i'm scott robertson and when it comes to strategic pr branding and marketing i've seen it all and actually i'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps join me each week on may the best brand win right here on intertalk radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable Make this your vinyl night. I'm John G.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Mastering Engineer Brian Lucy at Magic Garden Mastering. And when I'm not hanging upside down, polishing my crystals, and moving music a quarter decibel one way or the other, I'm listening to Making It with Terry Woolman. And so are you, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. I'm here with my guest, Michael Morris. Uh, Michael, why don't you pick up the story? So here it is, New Year's Eve, had to have been 1983, and I'm at a party, and this woman comes up to me and she goes, didn't you work in the federal building downtown for the Treasury (laughs) Department? And I don't know her. And I go, yeah, I did. I left. And she said, yeah, you were a lawyer there. I used to see you in the hallways. And I said, okay, that's nice. My name is Michael Morris. And she goes, my name is Darlene Perry. And I said, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm here with my sisters. And there were four sisters. It was Darlene Perry, Carolyn Perry, Sharon Perry, and Lori Perry. And we sing. And, of course, you know, my first thought was, yeah, everybody in L.A. either sings or acts, right? Right. That's nice. Right. So, <laughs> So I said to her, really, you sing. Who do you sing with? And she goes, Pat Metheny. Now she names one of my all-time music (laughs) heroes, Pat Metheny, right up there with Jeff Beck. And I said, how did you meet Pat Metheny? And she said, what we did was we took Pat Metheny music and we added our four-part harmonies to songs that Pat had composed, songs like the one about the late, great uh, Jocko, Jocko Pistorius. And they sent an unsolicited cassette to Pat Metheny, who called them. And next thing you know, they're out on tour with Pat Metheny. And these sisters had insanely great voices. We used to say that yeah. Lori, Lori Perry could sing the phone book and make it sound great. So Yeah, they're, what a great group. Right. And at any rate... She said, by the way, we just got a record deal. We're looking for a lawyer. (laughs) And I thought, hey, I'll be your lawyer. So I literally met my first music clients. had nothing to do with the music business. Darlene had worked downtown in the federal building. She recognized me from being there in the hallway, and I did not know her. But uh, the Perry sisters ended up becoming my first music clients, and I, love that. I took them to uh, a wonderful agency, Agency for Performing Artists, APA, because mm-hmm. my friend from college had an uncle who was an executive at APA, and I got introduced to Danny Robinson, who is still at APA 34 years later as an agent. And so Danny Robinson and APA ended up agenting the Perry sisters, and... Uh, I did their first deal, and that actually led to my second music client because they were produced by the wonderful Patrick Henderson, and Patrick had issues. I did. I had met him because he had produced the Perry Sisters' first record. Didn't really know him, but a friend of mine from the gym went to Patrick's church, and I can talk about this because it was public record, otherwise I could not, but Patrick mm-hmm. had some rather severe old IRS problems, and there was a lien against his house. And unfortunately, far too many musicians aren't properly advised. They get involved in tax troubles, which could have been avoided. But here was Patrick calling me up, and he hired me originally as his tax attorney. And Patrick, by the way, had done things like he had co-written Real Love with Michael McDonald. He Mm -hmm. had been Leon Russell's uh, music uh, director on the road, Leon Russell actually took Patrick out of the gospel church, I believe in Texas, and took him on the road. And Patrick was working with all kinds of people, the Pointer Sisters. He was a staff songwriter at CBS. So I'll never forget what I ended up doing was renegotiating his deal at CBS Songs so we could get in advance to get his tax troubles put behind him. And the funny thing was when he ended up selling his house, I had a condo, which I had sold. We were both sort of in between. And Patrick said to me, would you want to buy something together? And we ended up buying a beautiful old duplex in Mid-Wilshire in, uh, I guess this was, I'm guessing, it was probably about 1989. And 
we ended up owning that for about 10 years. And I remember so, that place. Yeah, it's a beautiful home. Right. We Patrick have, was downstairs, right? Yeah. But Patrick was downstairs. I was upstairs, but all his musician friends would come over. And Patrick also was the minister of music at uh, West Angeles uh, Church of God in Christ, which was one of mm-hmm. the largest churches, if not the largest, in uh, South Central L.A. Bishop Blake was the bishop, and they had the best music there. Uh, Patrick brought the Doobie Brothers there. He brought the Winans there. So Patrick was a very interesting person because he had the pop side, but he also was producing a lot on the gospel side for Sparrow Records. And so that was my second music client. And that sort of really opened the door for me to start meeting people in the music industry. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I love the randomness of it, you know, because your story is so similar to... Um, the stories of so many people that I've interviewed on this show, which which is just to be open and you know and and be focused, but be open to what presents itself to you, and then the world opens itself up to you, and you have this and wonderful career. You know, but we don't, and, you know, I, I always say, and I tell this to my young lawyers, but I tell it to everybody: if you don't throw bread on the water, I will tell you what will happen: nothing. Right. I mean, who would and, think that you you working for the IRS would lead to having such a great first music client? That, there's a, a beauty in, in that. Right, right. It, it was just one of those serendipitous events, but mm-hmm. it was a great story. And through them, I'll never forget, I got to meet Pat Metheny, and uh, we were doing, we, uh, Pat Metheny <laughs> was doing <laughs> an unannounced little show at the Comeback Game, which was a wonderful, historic, much uh, loved and now gone jazz vegetarian restaurant where they would literally pass the hat to pay for the musicians who paid there. And I remember Sharon Perry called me because they were doing several nights of the Greek theater with Pat Metheny and I went to every show. And I think I saw Pat Metheny like three times in one week with the Perry sisters. And by the way, their name was Perry, P-E-R-I, although their last name was P-E-R-R-Y. It was a nice little play on words. Right. And I, I asked Pat Matheny, so speaking of making it, Terry, I said, how did you make it? How did you get started? He had been a Berkeley uh, School of Music graduate, and he said, Mike, I played wherever and whenever I could. I gave right. as hard as I could just to build my fan base. And I think there's a lot of truth to that then, and I think there's a lot of truth to that now. So Pat told me, yes, I was actually doing up to 300 gigs a year just to get my career going. Wow. You know, since speaking of artists like Pat and, and Perry, and you know, you've, you have worked with a lot of very eclectic um, artists, and not just in music, but in film and television, and you, you know, you... Um, you, you know, even, I'm, and I'm asking you this because of the diversity of the people that you've worked with. What do you think is a key ingredient or the key ingredient ingredient that makes artists successful? Do you, do you notice anything in common with the people that have like what you're just talking about, Pat, you know, Pat just saying, I, I basically played, I got out there, I did everything I could to expose myself is, is, is there common ground that you see in people that are successful? Yes, they worked without a net. Ah. This, this was what they wanted to do. They didn't have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. They worked without the net. Boy. And, uh, you know, it, it's pretty amazing when you think about that. Uh, I've been fortunate, mm-hmm. for example, to uh, have worked with Alice Cooper for a number of years. And, of course, uh, mm-hmm. Shep Gordon, the phenomenal manager uh, was very successful in guiding Alice's career. And by the way, there's an incredible movie about Jeff Gordon called Supermensch. And if you haven't seen it... Yeah, I've seen it. It's um, fantastic. Right? Yeah. But, you know, to me, that was a lesson in terms of what they did because, you know, here Alice Cooper had moved from Detroit to Phoenix. His father was a... Minister, his his last name was uh, Fernier, right? So he had a very strong religious background, and 
you know, his his original first band. Speaking of Jeff Beck, was a Yardbirds cover band, and he told a very funny story to me about one time they opened literally for the Yardbirds, and then when the Yardbirds came out, they had played all the Yardbirds material already, and he said, "Yeah, and the crowd liked us better." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right? But but when when uh, Alice Cooper came out here, he was not. Well, he wasn't really known. It was they had their look, which was extremely unusual at the time, and most everybody who saw Alice Cooper hated them, except Frank Zappa liked them. And the story, which I asked Alice whether it was true, he said yes. Is that Frank Zappa went down to see them? Uh, there was another group he was working with called the GTOs. This is way back in the day. GTOs stood for Girls Together Outrageously, and you know Frank had a lot of interesting artists. Um, he had uh, he was involved, I believe, in the label Bizarre Straight. I'm um, going by memory. He had people like Tim Buckley, but he went down to see Alice Cooper, and then he said uh, something like, "Why don't you come to my house?" Lower Canyon at seven, and you know we'll do an audition. Alice and the rest of the band showed up at seven in the morning. Not not p.m. <laughs> right. <laughs> they thought, and they they rang his doorbell, and the story is that Frank Zappa comes down, opens the door. He's got a cup of coffee in his hand, and he said, "Well, since you guys are here anyway, let's do it." <laughs> but <laughs> but it was the same where. And you look at an Alice Cooper. Why, why would an Alice Cooper have such an amazing career for so many years? Uh, because there was no net. They came out here. They worked. Worked. The work ethic, to me, is the single common thread that I see. Just the work ethic. And if you see somebody like Alice Cooper perform now, like when we went out to see him open for Motley Crue a few years back, when Motley Crue was doing there. Farewell tour, Alice and his band give 110% every time. And actually, can I, can I segue and tell you one little story about somebody who always gave 100%? I don't work with him, although we, we've done Absolutely, some and we, we've got about five minutes left in, the, in our show. But absolutely. Okay, so here it is. It's 1971. I'm going into New York to see a singer at Max's Kansas City because my friend's older sister was doing what you call a video. Right? 1971. Right, uh, the guy who opened it on the piano. Right? And it's a legendary club. It was where the Velvet Underground played, people like that. So the guy who opens is on piano, and he's singing about Jersey. He's singing about Asbury Park. He's singing about a girl named Sandy. And I thought, God, this guy is singing about all the things. You know, we would hang out at Asbury Park and Seaside. So the first time I saw Bruce Springsteen, he was not signed. He was literally 10 feet away, opening for David Blue, who had written the song The Outlaw Man, which was big hit for the Eagles. And then when Bruce first came out, here I am, I'm a writer at University of Pennsylvania. And I said, man, I saw this guy at Max's Kansas City. I'm telling everybody, this guy's really good. He's really good. And my friends, because I was very much into Dylan. I was into Leonard Cohen. I was into Lou Reed because I had bought the first Velvet Underground record in mono, I might add. Right. (laughs) And my friends were all telling me, why do you always like people who can't sing? And then Bruce came to Philadelphia. Right. And I said to my friends, you got to go. They all came back. Oh, my Lord. Right. Then. Fast forward, I'm in Tucson. Bruce's second album came out, The Wild, The Innocent, The Eastwood Shuffle. He still is not known other than in Philadelphia, Phoenix, and Jersey. But he comes to Tucson. I invite about 20 friends down, which accounted for probably literally 15% of the house. There were maybe, I don't know, maybe 250, 300 people there. And I brought 20 of them. Bruce played for over two hours like there was 50,000 people there. And I never forgot that because he was a guy still just getting started, just like Pat Metheny, playing his heart and soul out. So I didn't mean to segue back, but I thought I would tell you no, that. No, but it's a, great, it's a really great point. You know, I saw a Gino Vanelli show in Miami when I was growing up, and it was the same story. Gino, Gino was on stage with his band. And I, I had an opportunity to tell him the story when I saw him backstage uh, recently. And right. there were pretty, there were more people 
on stage than there were in the audience. And it was one of the most incredible shows I'd ever seen. They played like they were playing to 100,000 people. I never forgot that, and that set the bar for me. Yeah, we've both seen Uh, that. And also, getting back to your question, because I know we're running out of time, but, you know, in terms of making it now, we we live in such an interesting age because I, I just did a panel for the entertainment industry conference for the Cal CPA Society, and it was a music panel. And we now live in an age where revenue from streaming accounts for more than 50% of all revenue in the record business because people don't want to buy CDs. They don't want right. to download onto their iPods, but they're consuming more music now than ever. So we certainly are at an interesting point in the history of the music business, but I think it presents such great opportunities because if you're a new artist, you're a new band, and you can put something up on Spotify, and you can put up where you're playing, or you can go on YouTube, and of course YouTube is very controversial because of what they pay or don't pay, and how they monetize through their ad rev sharing model, but putting that to one side, the number of streams whether it's on a YouTube or Pandora or Sirius, it's billions and billions and billions. So that's the world we live in. But it also, I think, affords artists a wonderful opportunity if they properly put their music out there and they put time and thought into their craft and they put it up that a lot of really wonderful artists are getting discovered that way. So I think we're living in just an amazing time uh, when it comes we to music. We certainly are. You know, speaking on that, um, we're in the last 20 seconds of, of the show. So um, I want to, I, I think I want to do a little bonus question and after we're done and we'll post that separately uh, to continue what you were talking about. So I want to thank you so much, Michael. Uh, and we're going to post your website so people can find uh, where to reach you if they want to hire you. And uh, thanks for spending the hour with us. Michael Morris, you are a great friend. Thank you, Terry. So, Michael, speaking a little bit more about streaming, which is which is really, you know, like you said, it's very profound that there's more music being consumed and and listened to than ever before. But the income stream has changed. So, what what's your point of view? Like, where do you where do you see income revenues for artists? Do you think it's important to let uh, people stream your music any, anywhere and everywhere. W- where do you see the music business going? What you know? How do how do we maneuver through this? I did a panel about five years ago, and streaming was first starting to become a commercial force. And there was an article which I quoted from, which said, "If you are not streaming music, you may as well be performing it in Latin." That was five years ago. Mm-hmm. Wow. So what has happened since then has been just game-changing because since streaming is such a large part of the overall revenue pool, and, of course, you have companies like Sound Exchange, which are collecting performance royalty from the digital performance of masters on non-terrestrial radio like uh, Sirius and Pandora, the revenue model has shifted so that while it certainly is a business of micro, micro pennies, there are billions of those micro pennies being added up. So it reminds me almost of the old Grateful Dead model where they didn't give a damn who taped their shows because it led to becoming one of the cultural phenomena. You know, you can say what you like about the dead, but can't argue with the fact that they became one of the world's largest touring bands and they let people pass around their music So my thought on it is, as far as putting up music and letting it stream, that is the world we live in. And of course, last week, one of the last holdouts, Bob Seger, just put up his music available for streaming now. I believe Mm -hmm. it's on Spotify. So almost every iconic band now is letting their music be streamed. And of course, for new bands, that's the world you live in. So basically what you're saying is not only uh, let your music be streamed, but let it be streamed everywhere it, in, in the same sense where the Grateful Dead not only allowed but encouraged people to uh, 
record and bootleg their their shows. So it, you're you're saying that's that's the new source of revenue, and we need to just get with the program. Definitely, and it's not such a new source of revenue anymore. And don't forget, right. necessarily free because a lot of it is monetized, but it's also a great way to expose people to your mercy. And look, Terry, at the end of the day, as a musician, as a performer, you know this, you have to have your music heard. You have to build your audience. That's That's how you make it. Right. You know, the argument with that is that, you know, there are many artists, myself included, who have had, for example, a million and a half streams of a single song, and it hasn't really amounted to a lot of revenue. Right so, now, I, I agree with you, Terry, that a lot of times the number of streams translates to a disproportionately low payday for the musician. And, of course, that is something which is in a state of flux. Uh, people with a lot more clout than me in the music business are trying to change that, whether it's what YouTube ultimately pays or what the uh, Pandoras and the Sirius XMs of the world pay. Uh, for the performance of the music, but it's in a state of flux. So I I certainly don't defend the low pay that a lot of musicians are receiving right now, but the point is get involved, whether you're getting involved with the California Copyright Conference, the American Independent Music Publishers Association, uh, Raise Your Voice Through Naris. There are a lot of people who are involved trying to get this changed, but you're right, Terry, right now, For a lot of people, the streaming revenue is somewhat pitiful, but the flip side is you live in a world where nobody, for the most part, wants to buy a CD. Certainly millennials don't want to own anything, right? Mm -hmm. And and I ask people people my generation, when was the last CD you bought? And I get a blank stare. Right. Or maybe they bought one or two. Yeah. So that's, that's the world we live in. It is, yeah, and it's important to um, acknowledge and embrace that and not be fearful about that. Um, Certainly, uh, touring uh, has become the greater source of revenue. Um, Licensing for film and TV is another way. I know it's it's getting harder to get in the door on that. Um, But, you know, I think it's really important for people to remember, as you mentioned, that the exposure, uh, like Pat Metheny was telling you, um, getting out there and being heard is really there's there's a, a value greater than monetary um, to that, and I think it's important to understand to not forget that. You know, we we write music and or make paintings or or dance or theater or whatever the art form is. If if it doesn't ever leave your room, then it's it's not a it, it's not a complete artistic expression. You know, it it needs to be all you are at that point. All you are at that point is a legend in your own backyard. (laughs) It's true. Uh, You mentioned that. Oh, go ahead. But what I wanted to play it back and pay it back to you because you recently worked on a phenomenal documentary called uh, "If You Can Read the Obit, Eat Breakfast," which is a Carolina line. Eat breakfast. Yes. Thank you. The point being that you had the opportunity to produce Tony Bennett. You put the band together. You were in the studio with Dave Van Dyke with some of the greatest musicians on the planet at Capitol Records Studio where Frank Sinatra recorded, and HBO was giving this documentary a wonderful push. So here is Terry Wallman sharing a bill, sharing credit in the same movie with Carl Reiner, with Mel Brooks, with Norman Lear, with Dick Van Dyke, with Tony Bennett, and you're the one who's killing it musically. So that, to me, is another way of making it because that is just such a blue-chip credential, you doing that for Tony Bennett and Dick Van Dyke. So my hat's off to you, by the way. Well done. I really appreciate that. And also not to forget Alan Bergman with Dave Grusin, um, which was who is the third artist that, that we recorded with in that movie. So that's called, yes, if you're not in the obit, Eat Breakfast. It's on HBO, and it's a really beautiful movie. Um, we, In closing, I want to ask you a final question, but uh, you had mentioned California Copyright Conference and a few other organizations, and I want to be sure that we post those um, web links 
uh, on the page for Enter Talk Radio with with your interview, so everybody can go and get involved. Like you said, just be involved and and be proactive. Uh, my final question to you is: at this uh, point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what advice would you give your younger self? That is such a great question. And I guess if I was going to give my younger self any advice, it probably would be do what you did, but do it even harder. And I'm a pretty intense person, <laughs> yes. and I got involved early. But you know, looking back, and I'm always trying to keep a foot in both camps, which makes me a little different from a lot of attorneys in terms of the entertainment side and the tax transactional side, but because of my love of music and entertainment, I probably would have focused even harder on it back in the day. But then again, hey, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate because I look at the people I work with, which uh, ranges from world-class musicians like yourself to Grammy winners to I uh, recently started with an icon like Johnny Mathis to uh, a, a young kid named Jules Galli, who's performing at the Hotel Cafe, and he's 20 years old. So I've been pretty fortunate in terms of the array of artists and the quality of talent. And I think at the end of the day, I know you asked me a different question, but when people ask me, what type of music do you like? I always say, I like good music. Mm. And that, that to me has always been the test as to when I want to get involved. But in hindsight, probably would have shifted even more toward getting involved on the music side earlier. But having said that, I think I did okay. On that note, I would agree. And thank you, Michael, for spending the hour and a little bonus time with me as well. I really appreciate it. Very my pleasure. See you all next week. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Brew. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be the music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.